Hey, good evening. I'm Dr. Robin. I'm the co-founder of the Whole Food Muscle Club. And today is March 22nd. So if you are in the United States, we are kind of at the very beginning of the COVID-19 thing. And what I'm starting to see is more people are doing cooking at home. Like they're, they're doing it themselves because restaurants are closed and they can't get uh, quick meals in the grocery store because they're sold out. And so more people are cooking. And what I've started seeing is people saying, I feel like I'm reading a foreign language. I don't know what these words mean in these recipes. And so I thought, you know what? Rather, usually I come on here on weekends and I cook something for you. I just, you know, make something. But today I thought I would just do some really basic, this is what, this is what these terms mean, this is how you do it. Um, and I went and got, I dug out. So this is a really old cookbook. This Betty Crocker cookbook was given to me in 1990. The copyright on it is 1961. And there are some things in it that are completely irrelevant. Things like, make sure you freshen up your makeup before you sit down for dinner. No, who cares? But there were a bunch of terms in it that um, I went and I got, put some sticky notes together for you that I'm gonna share with you because I think that it, they'll be helpful. But before I get to that, I wanna talk to you a little bit about kind of measuring things and you know how, how that works because you might be confused about it. So let's talk first about measuring cups. You might have seen measuring cups that look like this. It might happen to be uh, Pyrex, so they feel like they're glass. Um, this is a one cup measuring cup and this is a two cup measuring cup. And then I have a set of nested measuring cups that um, these are stainless steel. You can, I've seen them in plastic as well. Um, and they come in a quarter cup, a third of a cup, a half a cup, and a one cup. And you might be wondering, well, why do you need both? So these measuring cups are meant for measuring liquid. They have a little pour spout on them and they're, they're designed to measure liquid. These are meant for measuring dry goods. And um, you can use these for measuring liquid, but you, you're not gonna get as a good a measure because this you can actually like look at it and you can see. Whereas this, you have, to, you have to fill it all the way to the very, very, very top. And if you spill it, then you lose some. Now, some people, when they have these nested measuring cups, they ask, well, so how come they give me a quarter cup, a half cup, and a full cup, but they only give me one third? They don't give me the two thirds. I don't know. I don't know the history of measuring cups. I don't know why they come in these, uh, this grouping, but this is how you'll usually find them. Um, and if you need two thirds, just use your one third twice. The other thing that you need to be aware of is that sometimes when you measure things using your dry measuring cup, it is you're gonna pack it. So for example, one thing that you almost always, I've never seen a recipe that didn't call for it this way, brown sugar. Brown sugar is something that you wanna pack in and make sure that you get it nice and level. And I wanted to show you, and I didn't get myself a butter knife, so let me reach across and grab a butter knife a second. I'm going to show you something. So when you're packing, you're going to use a spoon and just pack it in there. And then to be able to tell whether it is level or not, hey Sandra, it's good to see you too. You're going to take the back of a, of a butter knife, so the back of your butter knife is level, and you can just run it across. And that's going to tell you whether you've got it level or not. That works really well for measuring things like flour or white sugar, um, and even brown sugar, which you're gonna pack in there, um, you can be able to tell where there's air. Now you might be saying, well now Robin, I've seen you cook and I know you don't measure anything. And that is true. I don't do a lot of measuring when it comes to how I cook. I tend to just kind of throw things in. Um, but that comes from a lot of experience. I grew up cooking. I'm the oldest of eight children, so I did a lot of cooking. My mom did a lot of cooking. So um, I don't measure. Um, I'm actually pretty good at just kind of throwing things in. But if you're following a recipe, especially if you're new to cooking, you're going to want to measure. And if you are baking, make sure you measure. That is why Russ makes our bread, because I'm lousy at measuring and he's good at measuring. And things like flour, you don't want to scoop because that compacts it. Uh, flour, you want to use a spoon, put it in there, and then use the back of your knife to flatten it off. Um, sugar, regular white sugar, you can scoop. It doesn't matter. That's usually how it's measured. So something to be aware of when you're using uh, measuring cups. These, this kind is for dry uh, material, and these are more uh, for your, your wet, wet goods um, going here. So that's your kind of things you're going to want for that. Then I wanted to talk to you about... Now this is kind of a funny one to me, because for me, and I don't know what you call them, but for me, these things are spatulas, 
Can't hold on, my beans are done. Let me turn my, di my timer off. Oh, sorry about that. I was cooking beans. So these things are spatulas and they're used to um, like scrape the edge and to fold. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what folding means. So these are spatulas, but also these things, which are used for flipping things are also spatulas. And um, so that can cause some confusion in your kitchen. Don't fight with your spouse about it. Just ask for the flippy thing, it works better. Um, and then these are spatulas. So that's, a, that's funny for us, something we deal with. Um, then let's talk a little bit about measuring spoons. You, this is a, a pretty large nested set of measuring spoons. This one, it's interesting because it has two of them that are labeled one tablespoon, except this one has a little ridge in it that says one tablespoon, and then the, I guess it's a, another half, so it's a tablespoon and a half. And then this one is actually one tablespoon. But what's interesting about this is I've told you before, a tablespoon is four teaspoons. But apparently, according to this little thing, it's just better than, like four, tables, four teaspoons is just better than a tablespoon. But um, we use it, I use these interchangeably. But like I said, I'm not super good about measuring things, but that's something to be aware of. It also has um, a teaspoon and a teaspoon and a half, which I have no idea why you need both, but mine happens to have both. Um, then it has the half teaspoon, which, okay, that's fine. It has a quarter teaspoon, which if you're measuring spices, that's, that's good. Mine also has an eighth of a teaspoon. I have never used this because what I was taught is that a pinch is about an eighth of a teaspoon. And so I just, when something says an eighth of a teaspoon, I literally just grab it with my two fingers and my thumb and go that much. But mine does have an eighth of a teaspoon. You don't need a set that's this uh, fancy. If you can get one that has a quarter, a half, a teaspoon and a tablespoon, you're, you'd be good to go. And even if you can't get a tablespoon, you could always use um, your, your teaspoon four times. We'll give you a tablespoon. Now, some people will say, well, why can't I just use the, the silverware that I use? I have tablespoons. Hey, Wendy, it's good to see you. I have tablespoons and teaspoons that I eat with. Why can't I just use them? So those measures are not gonna be um, what they use in cooking. Those are um, not congruent across the board. Tablespoons come in different sizes. They come in different bowl depths. Your teaspoons can be different. So you're not gonna get a good measurement um, if you're using your flatware that you eat with to measure. And now, if you're cooking, it's probably not a huge deal. If you're baking, that's gonna be a problem. So you're gonna wanna get you know, a set of measuring spoons that's gonna be um, helpful to you. Um, okay, I wanted to talk about the difference between grating and grinding because um, I guess there's some of that. So you can get, oh, I touched my face. Good thing I'm at home, huh? All right, so grating. You, have, you can get a regular, this is called a box grater, and it has you know, your regular grating side. It has a side that's meant for slicing, which I don't know if I've ever used this side. And then it has these little tiny ones, and these, I've never effectively used this pokey side of my grater, except for have it poke my hand when I'm trying to use this side, because I feel like it just, makes a mess. And since I got my food processor, I've used my box grater even less. I almost never use this anymore because with my food processor, I don't have to worry about banging up my knuckles on it. But when I was a kid, this was a staple in the house. We used it all the time. So you, you might hear uh, someone say, oh, or a recipe might say, great. If they say to grate something, they mean to use this. Can you see it? I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, there you go. The, the holes on this side. Um, of, your, of, your, of your box grater, or you might have a flat grater. So that's what grating means, is to use this part of your grater. Um, you might also see, and I have this itty bitty tiny little one, can't even hardly see it. This one came with a nutmeg, like literally the, a nutmeg thing that you would grate the whole thing. Um, I've never used it, it's completely silly. I don't know why I still have it, but I was able to find it, so I thought I'd show it to you. Um, now, so that's grating. Now what you'll also hear is you'll hear grind. And grind means to use something like, this is a pepper grinder. Um, I picked this one up in Istanbul, so you probably aren't gonna find one like this one. But this one happens to have a, the grinder on the bottom and then it has a little base that it sets in. And you can either, so Russ uses it differently than I do. He holds this top part still and he turns the bottom, whereas I rotate, so I'll put it on here, I'll show you. I rotate the top like this. So you can use it either way. So that would be grinding. This is a manual grinder. We use this for pepper. That's what our, um, our pepper grinder is. Yolanda, hey! 
Um, so that is grinding as a pepper grinder. Now, this is a regular coffee grinder that we have. We actually use it because I tell you, uh, you know, we, flaxseed is really good for you. Flaxseed, chia seeds, they have omega-3s in them, really good for you, but it should be eaten ground because if you break up the seed, it makes them more bioavailable, which means that your body can get access to the good stuff, the nutrients that's in there, better. So we just have a coffee grinder. Um, we use it pretty much exclusively for that. I also use it for, um, we got some cumin, whole cumin recently. Probably won't do that again. Um, I feel like it doesn't grind very well, but that we use it for that. And it actually smells like cumin right now. So um, this is a, a, a coffee, just regular coffee grinder. Um, I got it for Christmas probably 15 years ago, and uh, it works really well. So you can get these pretty cheap at like Kohl's or Walmart or whatever, and they work really well for your spices. So if it says grind, this is what it means. You can also use a pestle and mortar, which I don't have one of those, but that's one of those uh, stone bowls with the, with the pestle is the grinder thing, and you kind of grind into it like that. You see that um, old world kind of stuff is ground that way, um, and you get a much more coarse grind. Oh, and that's something I should talk about. So when you grind things, you can get coarse ground, which if you drink coffee, you probably know what that means. And that means that the pieces are bigger. Or you can get fine ground, which means the pieces are much smaller. It's ground much more aggressively. And so you might see that in a recipe where it says coarse ground or, um, or fine ground. You might see medium grind, which is obviously in between. So those are some things you can do. Um, I have found that generally speaking, when you're cooking, it's not as big of a deal as people make it when it comes to coffee as to how you um, grind, your, uh, grind your spices or whatever. So, all right, so that's those things. So let me look at my, my notes here. Again, these are notes I took from this really old Betty Crocker cookbook that I have. Um, some different things you might see in recipes. So um, let's start with different techniques for mixing things together. Because I, I found a whole bunch of them. It was kind of funny as I was going through it, I was like, oh yeah, I know what all those words mean. But I realized if you, uh, if you don't recognize them, you might be like, I don't know what all those, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with that. So let me make sure I have my notes in a reasonable order here. All right, so when mixing things, you might hear, it might say to beat them. And you also, to beat something or also to whip. You may see those two things are kind of used interchangeably. And they mean to mix rapidly to incorporate air. Now, when you're uh, whipping something, a lot of times you'll see the word whip when it comes to like whipped cream and eggs, which because we are plant-based, we don't do that. But if you're gonna do it by hand, you're gonna need a fork and you're gonna have to work really hard to kind of get the uh, air whipped into them. But beat means the same thing. And you might do that um, with a batter. Some batters um, require air to be beat in them. But be careful because there are some things that you can over mix and then it, it can cause a problem, like your cake can be flat if you over mix it. So um, beat and whip are two things you might see. They're, that means to incorporate air to mix really quickly, typically with a fork or with um, an electric beater of some kind or another. Um, to stir, that means to mix in a rotating motion. That's one you've probably, you know that one, right? You know how to stir things. So you stir the pot. Right, so that's what stir actually means to incorporate in, in a um, motion like that. Something to realize, if you are cooking over a stove and it says to stir it so it doesn't stick to the bottom, don't just go around because what will happen is your middle won't get the spoon across, the, across it and it'll burn in the middle. Like your edges will be fine because your spoon is running across the bottom, but the um, middle will, get, will burn. So if you're stirring something while it's heating to make sure that it doesn't stick or burn, you need to make sure that you um, kind of incorporate, do a figure eight or go back and forth or whatever, but make sure that you're stirring the whole thing, not just the edge of the pot because that will allow it to burn in the middle. Um, to fold, so I used that term a minute ago when I was showing you the spatulas. To fold means to very gently kind of go around the edge and turn and go through the middle and turn. And when you do that, it's because you don't want to um, flatten something. You don't want it to deflate. So you might see, you might see it says fold. You'll do that a lot with, um, if you have like a cream and this can be, you know, an almond milk cream or any kind of cream you're using. If you're incorporating uh, fruit or something into it, you might take it and turn it. So that's what fold means, is to literally take it and turn it together and be really gentle with it. That's a gentle way of incorporating things. Um, 
So mix just means bring it together. There's really, I wasn't able to find something other than stir to, to define mixing. So you can mix just about anything um, in any way, but it's not aggressive like beating or whipping. It's just kind of incorporating. So you might see mix is another one. You'll see that a lot when you're making things that have um, dry ingredients and wet ingredients like cake batter, where it'll tell you to mix the dry ingredients and mix the wet ingredients. And then usually they use the word incorporate, which means to take the wet ingredients and pour them into the dry ingredients and mix them into a batter. And I'll get in a minute to what batter versus dough is. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, another one that I found was puree. You've heard me use that word. Um, I puree soup sometimes um, with my immersion blender. Um, a smoothie is a good example of a puree. So that a puree just means that you mix something either in a blender or a food processor or with an immersion blender um, to bring it all together and make it um, consistent so that it's, it's not you know, lumpy like soup, but it's, it's more of a puree soup or like a smoothie. Um, one thing you might be interested in, this is kind of an aside, when you puree or smooth, create smoothies out of your food, it does make it 15% more bioavailable, which means that it goes from your lips to your hips 15% faster um, than if you actually chew it. And we do, you know if you watch Russ and I, that we do encourage you to chew your food because it is uh, part of your digestion process. It is, it is healthier for you to uh, chew your food, but if you have a recipe that says puree, that's what it means. It means to use a blender of some sort to incorporate everything together into a homogenous, can't say that word tonight, Humo nope, can't say it, sorry, to make it all the same. All right, to toss, and that is to mix without mashing is what it, the technical term means. You'll hear people say to toss a salad. It's often done by taking two things and just kind of doing this with it and to incorporate it. Um, the only time I've ever seen toss is with something that is like a salad or a fruit salad or something like that. I've never seen that term used um, when actually making a cooked dish. It doesn't mean it's not used that way. I just happen to not have ever seen it used that way. All right, so those are your cooking terms I wanted to share with you, I mean, mixing terms. So now let's talk about all the different ways you can cook things. I did not realize that there were so many uh, terms for cooking. So first, let's talk about the difference between a simmer, a boil, and a rapid boil. I think that that's something that people struggle with, um, and that is, um, you know, you need to know what that means. So a simmer is when you bring something, a liquid, typically it can be a soup, it could be chili, um, it could be water, it, my beans were simmering. Um, you bring it to the point where it's just not quite boiling, but it's kind of boiling. Um, it will have steam evaporating from it. You may get a tiny little bit of bubble, but it's just hot enough that it's, it's, the liquid is mixing. Like if you could see it, it would be moving about, but it's not breaking the surface aggressively. To boil something means that it's hot enough that the liquid is actually, the surface is breaking, which means um, the bubbles are coming up and, and if they're popping, but not enough to like splat. Um, especially this is something to consider if you're making something that's been pureed because you can really cause them, the bubbles to will splat. Um, the, now the difference in that and a rapid boil, a rapid boil means the top is really agitated. It's going like this, super agitated, super hot. And once something reaches a rapid boil, it can't get any hotter than that. Liquid, just, that's as hot as liquid gets and before turning into steam. So that's the difference between a simmer and a boil and a rapid boil. Something to consider um, when, you're, when you are cooking because you will see those simmer for X period of time. Usually if you're leaving something for a long period of time, it's at a simmer. That's, you don't typically leave things at a boil or a rapid boil because they do evaporate so quickly that you'll end up um, with the, the liquid going away, which is obviously not what you wanna do if you wanna cook. All right, let's talk about all these different kinds of chopping. There's lots of different words used for chopping. Um, you might see chop, rough chop, dice, cube, julienne, mince, parse, um, pear, peel, score, slice, shred, sliver. All right, so that's a lot of different words that all basically mean to cut something up. So let me go through them really quickly about what those words mean. So chop just means that you um, chop things up in usually equal parts because if you want them to cook evenly, they need to be uh, chopped up evenly. 
Um, chop does not really have, uh, this is how big they should be. It's just chop it up into, usually you'll eat, see chop into bite-sized pieces. That's something you'll often see in a recipe. Um, rough chop means that bigger pieces than bite size. Usually just means run your um, knife through it really quickly. I use a chef's knife and so when I do that I you know do one of these things. You've probably seen chefs do that. Um, rough chop is something you might do with like salad, um, lettuce, that kind of thing. Just run your knife through it real quickly to kind of break it up. No rhyme or reason. That's, that's a rough chop. Um, dice means that you're cutting it into equal parts. Usually about half, um, the technical term is a half inch cube. I never dice things that small, but um, that's what dice means and sometimes even smaller. So chop is bigger pieces, dice is smaller pieces, mince is even smaller pieces. So you'll see the word mince used with garlic. If you're gonna mince garlic, that's a lot of like chop it into little tiny pieces. Again, I don't do that. I use my food processor. I do not mince garlic anymore. I used to, but I don't anymore. Now I just I put it, throw it in my food processor. Cube is exactly what it sounds like. You'll hear cube used with uh, potatoes and squash, and that's to create basically cube-sized pieces that are all about the same uh, so that they cook at the same uh, speed. That's what cubing means. Julienne is to cut into slices, small slices. You, um, you might see, like if you go to a fancy restaurant, they'll julienne their carrots, where you get these little st carrot sticks-like things that are cut in these little tiny slices. I, as a home cook, I don't think I've ever julienned anything. I can't imagine why I would need to. Um, let's see. Pear means to remove the skin, like from an apple or a potato. And I thought, well, what's the difference between that and peel? So I looked it up. Apparently to pear something is such as an apple or potato, but to peel something is like an orange or a banana or a tomato. Now why a tomato got put in with the banana and the orange, I don't know. But we, I think now, and this is from this Betty Crocker book, which is very old, I think now the word peel is used much more than pear. Like you don't hear anybody, that you, you see the word paring knife, which is a small knife, but you don't ever, I haven't ever seen to pear something to mean to peel it. I think if it meant to peel it, it would just say peel it. I think that that's what you would see now, but I could be wrong. Um, to score something means to just cut a quick line across the top of it. You've heard Russ use that term when he talks about his bread. When he puts his bread into the hot Dutch oven, before he puts it in the oven, he scores the top with a quick line just to give it a place so as it rises it doesn't split. It gives it a nice straight line. So that's what score means. Um, shred is small pieces or to use a fork and to tear things apart. Um, people do this a lot with chicken or pork. Obviously we don't do that because we're plant-based but that's what shred means. Um, slice is to take the whole of something and make little tiny slices. So you slice a tomato um, in, in, into the pieces. So you'll see that you'll hear people say they uh, slice a banana, same thing, when you slice it into pieces, slice an apple. So that, that means you're slicing it into pieces that are the size of whatever the thing is that you're cutting up. Um, what else do I have on here? Oh, sliver. So sliver is a smaller form of julienne which means to you know, cut it really, really tiny. Again, as a home cook, I don't think I've ever slivered anything. You might hear uh, sliver with almonds. I think that's the only time I've ever seen the word sliver used is, is with almonds. And I, again, I would throw those in my food processor. I, at this point in my life, would never go after an almond with a knife. It just sounds like way too much work. All right, all these terms. So now I have a bunch of different terms for cooking like what it means to, to cook something. So I wanted to go through these because I think I feel like there's a lot of these cooking terms where pe people are like, okay, so I have this thing and it says to do this with it and I don't know what that means. So um, blanch, you might see the word blanch. That means to plunge something quickly into rapidly boiling water and then often you'll take it directly out of that and put it in cold water to stop the cooking process. If you want to peel tomatoes, it's very common to do this to peel tomatoes. If you're canning peaches and you want to peel them, you will blanch them first. So blanch means to take something, usually in its whole form, a whole tomato, a whole peach, put it in the water very briefly, a couple of seconds, pull it out, and then put it in cold water to stop the cooking process. And that, what that usually does, you do that typically to loosen the skin so that you can get the skin off of it. 
So if you see the word uh, blanch, oh, and you might see it with nuts too. Sometimes if you don't want the gritty texture of the skin when you're nuts, you can um, blanch them and the skin will come off really easily. I've never blanched nuts. I can't imagine why I would bother, but there's that. Um, steam. Steam means that you can use a, like a double boiler or you might have a steam basket and it means to put a small amount of liquid in the bottom and then put whatever you're cooking in the basket or in the top and the steam comes up and cooks it. And um, it, it works really well for things like broccoli because you don't end up uh, losing a lot of your nutrients like you would if you boil it. So that's what steam means. To steam bake something means that you put it in the oven but you have a pan with water in it. Um, you'll see this with sourdough bread where they, they cook the bread and they have, they'll have water in the bottom to create that real crusty feel on the outside of the bread. So that's steam bake. Bake in, by itself just means to cook with dry heat, which most people know what bake means. You have an oven, it has a bake function. You push the button, it says bake. You know what that means, right? To steep, that's S-T-E-E-P, is to soak something in hot liquid to remove the flavor. Most commonly, you've probably seen, the, seen this word used with tea. Um, you don't see it a whole lot with other things, but you can do it with spices as well. So you might see the word steep as referring to spices, and that's to soak something in hot water to remove the flavor. To stew means to cook slowly in a small amount of liquid, a crock pot. Use, uses the stew function. So if you were gonna um, use your, your crock pot, you would be stewing things typically. I mean, not always, because you can cook things like potatoes in a crock pot, but a lot of things in crock pot, you, you would, you're stewing them, and that's what it means to cook it slowly at, with a small amount of liquid. Um, toast, you probably know what that means because you have a toaster, but you can also toast in your oven, and it means to uh, brown something with direct heat. Um, and you can toast sesame seeds in a pan. So anything you're, you're cooking that's really dry with direct heat is gonna be toasting and your goal is to brown it. That's what the word toast means. Uh, let's see, poach. To cook by, bleh, I can't talk, hold on. Poach, to cook by surrounding and simmering but not boiling liquid. Um, you see this with eggs. Of course, we don't do this because we don't eat eggs, but um, it's when you have water that's not really vibrating really hard, because if, if it's really busy and you put something in it, it breaks it up. Whereas if it's just simmering, you can set something in it and it'll cook, but it won't break it apart. So that's what it means to poach. Roast is to cook, with a, again, with a dry heat, so the same as bake, same kind of uh, idea. Saute is an interesting one because saute, by definition, means to cook in oil, like to cook in just a small amount of oil, like you'd saute onions. But um, in plant-based, you know, we try to eliminate or at least limit the amount of oil that we use. And so you'll see um, recipes that are plant-based often say dry saute. And even when I use regular recipes, when it, say, it says to saute, I eliminate the oil because we just don't need the extra fat and the extra calories. And to do that, you would put it in your pan and cook it um, on a good heat with one of these things, whatever you call this flipper thing, and stir it around so it doesn't stick. And you can use a little bit of broth or water or whatever. So high heat to cook it. But typically, if you're your regular standard recipes, if you're not plant-based, um, saute means to cook in a little bit of oil. Um, scald, and that is to cook just below the boiling point. This is something that I've only ever seen used in, in regards to milk. Um, and so obviously I've never, I haven't scalded anything in a very long time, but you bring it to just below the boiling point and milk will get a really a kind of a thick layer over the top of it. And there are recipes, I've seen them, this cookbook has some of them that call for scalded milk. And that is what that means to just not quite boil it, but let it sit at that really high temperature and cook at that temperature. Um, and then sear is to brown quickly on a very high heat. Again, this is something most often seen in regard to cooking meat, but you can also sear vegetables where you uh, put them on a really high heat and let them brown. And that's what you'll often see um, with that. Um, let me see, what else? Oh, one thing I did, I promise, I, this is the last thing I'll talk about because I've already been on 29 minutes and that's a long time to talk about cooking things. But I wanna talk really quickly about batter versus dough because I think this is something that uh, people are running into as well. So a batter is something that's runny, something like pancake batter. 
something you can pour. And a wet batter means it pours more easily. So you can have a thick batter that's harder to pour and a wet batter that's easier to pour. And so that's, that's what a batter is, something that's pourable, um, usually made with a flour and a liquid, either milk or plant milk or water or whatever, and it's pourable. A dough, by comparison, is something that you can actually mold with your hands. So it's got more flour to the water or liquid, um, and it's not pourable, and it will rise. Batter won't rise, it'll bubble. It'll, because uh, as, it, as the air comes out of it, it just kind of pops because it's so thin. Whereas with dough, you can let it rest and it'll double in size because the gluten in the wheat will, will trap the air in it. You can also have what's called a sticky dough, and this is kind of a not quite batter, but not quite dough you could actually knead. And when you touch it, it sticks to your hands and it gets really, really sticky and stretchy. So you'll, you'll see that. And um, so it's something to consider if you're trying to make a dough that you can knead. If it's not kneading, if it's too wet, you're going to add some flour. But keep in mind that flour does absorb liquid over time. And so sometimes you'll have enough liquid in there and you just need to let it sit for a minute and it'll you know, be fine. Um, and if you add more, you're gonna end up with too wet of a sticky dough. So um, definitely I would tell you Russ is our bread maker, but be aware when you're working with, with flours and with waters that the, there's a continuing between a runny batter or what's called a wet batter and a, a dry dough, which is something that you can actually knead with your hands. So if you have any questions, um, I put our website wholefoodmuscle.com, the contact page up there. If you have questions about cooking or terms or something you'd like me to make um, plant-based, because I only cook plant-based these days, definitely send me an email, send me a message from our, our plant, our, um, I can't talk, our website, and I'll be happy to do another video. I do videos uh, like this once a week, either cooking or today giving you definitions. So I hope you found this helpful. I would love to see your comments. Um, if you have something you've run into that you're like, oh, I didn't know this term, I'd love to hear that too. So as we always tell you, eat real food, mostly plants. Have a good night. Stay safe. Stay healthy.